Hello, we are live and we are back. Happy Tuesday, the 19th of December. Apologies, guys, that I wasn't uh, live yesterday. I've had some internet problems that seem to be resolved now. So fingers crossed that continues and I can carry on going live every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and of course, main channel videos. And of course, now videos on the second channel, which is Stock Speak, if you haven't already subscribed over there. So what's been going on with Palantir? We've got a few uh, analyst predictions, a few analyst commentary that we're going to get onto. We've also got an event that's coming up for Palantir that I want to make sure you guys know about. We have um, an interview that a particular analyst that I really like has given about Palantir. And then we've got not just Palantir related, but we've got some predictions about 2024 that we'll have a look at. And then, of course, at the end of the live stream, we will jump over to Palantir stock, see what it's doing pre-market. And then, of course, the live chat as well. So anything you want to talk about, put in the live chat, any questions, anything that you want to let me know about your portfolio, what you're doing with Palantir, any outlook into 2024 that you've got, put it all on there. And if you're watching this and it's not live for you right now, make sure you turn on live chat replay because that is exactly what you'll need to see uh, as to the live chat. So let's start with this. Let me share my screen here. Now, this is a little bit old now. This, this came out on the 15th, but I think it's very, very interesting. So if you remember on, when was it? Around the 15th, I guess it was, because this is when the article came out. Palantir got awarded um, an extra extension to their army vantage contract. We knew about this. We've spoken about this. And ever since that came out, different analysts have, uh, you know, said what they think about this. One of them is holding a very bearish opinion and another analyst is very, very bullish on what's happened. So let's just take a look to see exactly what they've been saying. Hopefully this is big enough. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Zoom, zoom, zoom. There we go. <clears throat> so remember, this was Friday. Palantir shares moved higher at the start of Friday session after the company announced a one year extension of its partnership with the U.S. Army program worth up to $115 million. The provider of data analytics and AI said that the contract uh, contract, contract <laughs> includes $35.6 million in initial funding and an award of $97.4 million. Palantir shares hit blah, 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 blah. That's irrelevant, I guess, now. Palantir, which gains a significant portion of its revenue via government contracts, said that under the extended deal, it will continue to provide its open data and analytics platform and supply new AI-enabled capabilities and open platform infrastructure. So just to give you an idea, back in 2019, at the end of 2019, Palantir was picked by the US Army um, for a $458 million contract to power the Army Vantage, which is their platform. It's a very comprehensive data analytics platform to basically give the US Army the ability to carry out data-driven decision-making at a very high level. That's what it's for. Palantir was chosen to do that for them. The original contract was just for a base year. And then the army retained the right to either extend and have optional years, or they didn't have to. But after that initial year, they went back to Palantir and they extended multiple times. So they had one extension worth 110 million, another one 113.8 million, and another one, 116 million, and then this one here that came out at the back end of last week. So clearly Palantir are being very, very valuable here. So with that in mind, let's just see what different analysts have to say. <laughs> you, you'll know which analysts we're uh, speaking about in a minute. <clears throat> so just quickly, this is from Palantir. Palantir is honored to, to extend our work with the US Army as it involves uh, into the Army data platform solution. This extension is the evidence of the value that we bring to the nation's defense, including our joint efforts to provide more commercial technology providers the opportunity to equip soldiers with the innovation they need to meet their most pressing challenges. Here we go. Following the news, William Blair analyst Louis De Palma, <clears throat> which we've spoken about on this channel, and he, he, he's not the most bullish on Palantir. Let's just say that. Time and time again, he has made... Um, 
very bearish commentary on Palantir. He's reduced the price target for Palantir. He doesn't really think that it's a stock that you should be buying. Instead, you should be selling the stock, so on and so forth. And he he was the guy that made the comment um, about Palantir before the army contract, saying that they're not going to get it because of what he's heard from the US army. It, it was very inaccurate. We've discussed this before. That's all been resolved from the army themselves and Palantir now. But what, what's he saying now? So let's just see. So he's maintained his long-held bearish view of the stock, <laughs> keeping an underperform rating on the shares. So he still thinks that this company is not good as a long-term position. He still thinks it's going to be an underperform. So he stated in a note that shares of Palantir may start to reflect reality over the next three months once it is fully digestive that, digested that the U.S. Army last night only awarded Palantir a short-term one-year um, 150 million ceiling extension. So he's saying that it's it's bad because they only got the one year extension. But remember, they've they've been awarded a one year extension many times in a row. If Palantir wasn't the company that the U.S. Army wanted to work with for this, would they have really carried on working with them and giving them this money and these extensions year after year after year after that base contract? I want to say probably not. So I don't really understand the relevance of this when the, the history says that they keep going back to Palantir. But hey, let's keep reading here. Um, their second largest contract on the book, the, the Army Vantage Program. So he says, when the Army originally gave Palantir this contract in December 19, good memory, Haley, I got that one. It awarded Palantir a 458 million four year deal, the analyst wrote. That deal ended yesterday. Not only was the duration for the new contract reduced, but the max annual run rate was even slightly downsized from the prior 160 million revenue run rate. Palantir will likely will likely not even receive the 150 million as the army announcement indicated that it is just a ceiling value. The army has track record of only awarding Palantir less than 60% of the potential value of ceiling contracts. And then he's give some, gave, given some examples here. So let me know what you think about that. And then on the flip side, we've got a very, very bullish analyst that time and time again has, I would say, really taken the time to understand what Palantir actually does, because a lot of analysts don't really understand what Palantir does, I don't think. So Mariana, she is a Bank um, of American analyst. And like I said, she's been very, very bullish on this position many times before. Well-known Palantir bull. So maintained a buy rating with a $21 price target on the stock. She she and Bank of America have given Palantir a, a price target of $21 before, and they're maintaining that now. So this is not a new price target from them. They're just saying with this new information, do you know what? We're still maintaining our $21 and we're still thinking that this stock is a buy. Saying that the one year extension was unexpected. and then And then she said this. The up to 115 million contract extension is in line with the annualized rate of the original contract award, but slightly below the annualized actual action obligation and 15% higher than the option year two to three average obligations. That was a mouthful, but I think you probably understand what I'm saying, what, what this is saying. So they've gone on to say, we think that Palantir has a strong position to remain a key provider of data engineering um, in, in, in this data-centric operational strategy, the recent contract extension and the fact that Palantir can help, can add, sorry, AIP capabilities to existing offerings support our thesis. So I'm imagining most people that are watching this live stream or this video right now are probably more leaning to agree with the bullish side rather than the bearish side. And do you know what? I, I just... At this point, given everything that's happened with this particular analyst, the bearish analyst, it's just hard to really, I guess, believe what they're saying after time and time again, we've seen comments that are just completely not true. But hey, but hey, we have to make our own decisions. And there has been many times that, you know, the Fed have forecasted about interest rates or analysts have said particular things about a stock and they haven't happened. No one truly knows what's going to happen. So we couldn't bet that Palantir will reach $21 and we couldn't bet that Palantir is a sell. We have to just make our own decisions based on 
our own research. And to me, I very much lean towards the side of this being a very, very good company for not only the midterm, but also the long term. So what else has been going on? Well, we've got this. Now, this isn't particularly anything that you need to know to change your investing strategy or anything like that. This is just a FYI if you want to, you know, put this in your calendar so, so you remember. Basically, Palantir are holding a discussion series on AI in hospitals. So join us for a monthly series where we will be sharing our work and learnings from leaders across US hospital systems, including these here. And you'll probably recognize Tampa, General, um, Cleveland Clinic, lots and lots of organizations that we speak about in terms of how valuable Palantir have been. So this is the first event, Tuesday, January the 16th at 2.30 Eastern time. You probably, I haven't tried myself, but you can maybe even, you know, get the link to watch that in, in real time. Episode one is AI driven operations, building a capacity command center. So these are the people attending. I can very much imagine <clears throat> that, I, you know, I'll cover this after this event has happened, but I imagine we are just going to hear more and more about where the use of AI is going in the future in the hospital setting. And we already know that this, the healthcare sector is one of those sectors that Palantir are really, really growing in, really providing value in. Of course, recently we've got, we've had the NHS deal. That was another big catalyst ticked off for Palantir. And speaking about catalysts, I think that it's quite, okay, two things. One, there doesn't really seem to be any main catalyst left for Palantir this side within this year. We've ticked a lot of the big ones off. The Titan project has been extended. We're expecting to hear that extended, delayed. We're expecting to hear about that between January and March. So it feels like there's not a lot of momentum at the end of this year anymore. However, there is just a general Santa rally, if you will, across all stocks. And it, it is it does seem like a lot of stocks are especially since the uh, the Bank of England and the Fed have announced about holding rates and rate cuts potential in 2024. It does seem like a lot of stocks are having a bit of a run up towards the end of the year, which does, you know, it is a pattern that we do, <clears throat> excuse me, we do see time and time again, how stocks actually run in December. So we'll have to see what happens with that one. But yeah, maybe some people are getting a bit bored. Some people are selling, maybe some people are trading the position. And of course, then we're going to have earnings next year, which will be very, very interesting. And other catalysts that we have aligned for next year as well. So there is a lot coming. It's just a bit of a slower time th this half of December, which is really no big deal considering, you know, it was only last week that we got four new contracts or extensions to contracts. So now I want to show you an interview, but I'm going to have to reshare my screen. So let me do that now. So this is an interview um, from a guy that you probably have seen. His name's Keith Fitzgerald. He covers a lot of different stocks, Palantir being one that he is particularly bullish on. I think this is very interesting. So let me share my screen here. Have to share the tab. Here we go. So you should be able to, let me turn it up. You should be able to hear it, okay. So he's going to start by speaking a little bit about Intel, and then he'll move on to Palantir. NVIDIA, you, you've got a love affair with NVIDIA over to Intel, maybe, or or maybe both at this point. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I think Mr. Gelsinger is spot on. I have met him several times over the years. He's the right guy in the right seat at the right time for Intel. What I worry about is that this is a repeat of many of Intel's earlier successes. They're trying to be all things to all people, whereas NVIDIA and AMD are very, very focused. So I worry about the focus. I'm not in Intel. I don't own it. I probably won't own it. I am going to stick with NVIDIA and AMD because of that. Well, to be fair, they're, they're pretty focused on PCs. But, but Keith, you also have That's some winners, problem. and I'm dying to know... Uh, specifically which ones you still believe in. You have been bullish on Palantir and it has had an incredible year to date run. Well, thank you for remembering that. This is a tough business. It's very nice to hit one out of the park every now and then. Uh, I still am bullish on that one. I think that company is still getting started. The problem with it is not that people don't understand it, which is what everybody reports. They simply can't wrap their mind around AI. Consumers don't get it yet. 
That to me smells like opportunity. I think it's a fifty dollars stock a few years from now. I swear, I just saw a bird fly past your head. If that's a live pick. Okay, so what do we think about that? A fifty dollar stock a few years from now. That's what he's saying, and also he thinks that it's not it's not necessarily the problem that people don't understand what Palantir does, but more that people don't understand the true opportunity and the true necessity of AI, and therefore are not looking to the right companies. Maybe now I do think that I I completely agree with what he's saying, but I do also think there's a lot of people that don't understand Palantir. It's a very very confusing company. It really is, and unless you spend loads and loads of time digging into it. It's not one of those companies that you can just explain to, you know, a 10 year old within one sentence, unless you really, really go back to basics, I suppose. Um, $50 in a few years, I think it's definitely doable. My, I don't like to make price targets and price predictions because, you know, no one knows, literally no one knows. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw, you know, $30 by the end of 2024. But of course, that really does depend on many things. It depends on Palantir's performance, obviously, but it also depends on the macro. That could come into play. There's there's many things that, that happen that are going to move a stock up or down. Sometimes the movement in a stock price doesn't necessarily make sense and it doesn't marry up to what the value of the company, the intrinsic value is actually saying. So who knows if we'll see 50 in a few years or maybe even more, maybe maybe less. I guess you just have to separate your time horizon from this. If you are very much planning on this being a short term position, you're trading this company, which, you know, everyone can do their own thing. And that's fine. Then you kind of do need to make these big bets. But if you are planning on Palantir being in your portfolio for five years, 10 years, even longer, whether it reaches 50 next year, 2026, 25, 27, I guess it doesn't really matter as long as you know that over time it's going up because they are providing such value. And then you have to look at their financials and making sure everything is you know, healthy and in check over there? Are they hitting their goals? Are they hitting their forecasts? Are, is the demand there? You know, we can talk about AIP boot camps and everything like that. But yeah, to me, I am still very convicted. It's still my second largest position. I've recently added a new position, which I'm sure you guys have seen that video. Um, I wanted exposure to the gene editing and genomic sector. That's exactly what I've done. My plan moving forward, and I'll make a whole video about this, Tesla is still going to remain my largest position. Palantir is still going to remain my second. And then I'll start building up some other positions that I'm particularly bullish for. So next, this is this is interesting. This is really interesting. Let's take a look at this. So we have a, um, another analyst called Dan Ives, which is the guy that said um, Palantir is the messy of AI. You know that guy. He has the very bright outfits. He talks about Palantir very passionately and, and other stocks as well, not just Palantir, Tesla, um, other tech stocks. So he works for a company called Wedbush. I, I think it is. Is it even his company? I think it might be. Anyway, they've come up with a list that they shared on X. And in that list is kind of where they think the market is going in 2024. He also did the same thing last year and predicted 2023. Now, a lot of those things that he had on his list last year actually did happen. And, you know, he's not really, I don't think he's really necessarily making like intricate price targets. He's more just saying, this is a sort of sector uh, growth. This is the sector trends I expect to see. This is, you know, maybe what this company will be doing and so on. But this is really interesting. And I read this and I agree with personally a lot of it. So let's see what he has to say. And as we're going through this, do let me know if you if you can picture some of these things actually playing out in 2024, I do think maybe not all of these will happen within the next one year, but definitely in the next few. Share screen. Here it is. So let's just work through some of these. We won't spend too long on every single one, but definitely interesting. So number one is AI goes mainstream. We believe AI is the biggest transformation in the tech sector in the last 30 years and is a 1995 moment, not seen since the start of the internet in 1995. We believe AI will comprise 8 to 10% of IT budgets in 24, up from less than 1% in 23, represents a 1 trillion of spending over the next decade. I think, I think they're spot on in, in this, in terms of, Businesses, enterprises, even government organizations across the board will be looking 
to spend more money on AI. Surely there's no doubt about it. We're already seeing that happen and AI will just become a bigger and bigger and bigger portion of their IT budget as a company across all companies, I think. And this isn't sector restricted. We've seen this. Just looking at Palantir, you know, they are not sector restricted. Every company now is looking at how they can utilize AI to make their business better, to make them more productive, to make their top line grow. So, uh, yeah, I absolutely think that we'll see this. And what this means is as the money, as more money is going into AI, it's going to go into some of the massive companies, you know, the Googles, the Microsofts, them companies. But they're also going to be looking at businesses are going to be looking at what other companies do we want to be spending this budget on? In my opinion, obviously, one of them is Palantir. Not the only, for sure, not the only. But yeah, I definitely see that, you know, this is only helping Palantir because of their AIP. So, yeah, we're, we're definitely on the real um if you think about an S curve and an adoption curve, we're, we're, it's definitely picking up now. It's really, really rapidly ramping up. And it's it, it has the potential AI to be one of the biggest revolutions, I think, that we've ever seen. Moving on to number two, he's saying Apple introduces the AI app store. We believe that Apple will formally um, introduce the concept of a new AI app store. And we believe this could increase service revenue by five billion annually by 2025 once implemented. I don't hold Apple as an individual position in my portfolio. I've got a fund that has exposure to Apple as one of the largest positions in that fund. But individually, I don't have it. Fantastic company. Obviously, um, I just see more short short and midterm growth in other companies in particular. Personal opinion. I it, it would be like if I had to list maybe 10 companies that I'd look to add, Apple would be in there. I just see potential elsewhere, I guess. An AI app store. I don't really know what that entails. Like AI is already being integrated in recommendations and, and in different um, functions of different businesses already. But an AI specific app store, I wonder what that would look like. Then we've got mergers and acquisitions ramping up in big tech. We believe 2024 is set for a massive year of M&A uh, in big tech with Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, all aggressively going public and or private companies going after, sorry, to boost their product footprint. Software mergers and acquisitions could be historic in our opinion. Very interesting. So they're betting that some of the big tech names actually look to acquire public and private companies or merge with them. People have asked me time and time again on this channel, could a big, big company like ones that are named there actually acquire a company that is, you know, under 50 billion in, in terms of cap like Palantir. I've said I don't think so, but you know, they're they're betting on Dan Ives is betting on mergers and acquisitions to have a massive role in 2024. So, you know, maybe we will see lots of this. But in terms of Palantir, I don't know if Palantir will be acquired personally. It would be a big, big shock if they were. Next up, Tesla introduces a sub 30k vehicle by the end of 24. We, we've already had an interview that very much points towards this being the case. 2024, I think so. I think we'll at least know a lot more about it, um, whether it will be fully you know, ready to go to customers by, by that date, I don't know. But we believe Tesla will introduce a sub-30 car produced out of Mexico that could drastically change the volume game for Musk and co looking ahead. Again, this is something that I've spoken about time and time before uh, on this channel, a sub 25 sub 30 car mass affordable vehicle for Tesla will be humongous for so many different reasons. It will be absolutely massive. It will be a very, very strong catalyst for this company and this stock. We all know that my opinions on Tesla and the, the conviction that I have for this company moving forward, whether it's actually produced out of Mexico first is a different matter, but ultimately, where will it be produced? Yeah, absolutely. So then five tech stocks are up 20. 25% in 2024 is the next one. We believe tech stocks will be up 25% in 2024, led by a solid enterprise spending trajectory with AI as a major catalyst in the soft landing. So they are actually predicting that, hey, we will continue to see a bull run in the tech stocks moving forward. This is a really split thing right now. Some analysts are saying, do you know what? Tech bull run will continue. Others are saying, 
they will the big stocks will do well but they won't do as well as the small caps and then other people are saying nope that we're not going to see we're not going to see the same thing happen in 2024 as we have this year so very very split very split number six apple buys espn is that i think that's a big sports channel over in the us i hope that could be really wrong haven't really looked into this one too much. We believe the answer and the shoe that fits for Apple is the golden S ESPN asset, which potentially may be on the table in one form or another. Um, okay, and then we're talking about Disney here as well. Seven is particularly interesting, in my opinion. Cybersecurity is the best subsector of tech. What do you guys think about that? We've seen, like, look here, crowd. Um, that, that's CrowdStrike, right? Yeah, CrowdStrike. That would have been a bit embarrassing. Has had a phenomenal year. What's CrowdStrike done year to date? 151%, just over 151.5% on the year. So they've said, while the past year we have seen some ebbs and flows around deal flow and the transformational shift to the cloud puts the cybersecurity sector in. And so, so what they are saying is that out of all the tech sectors, the best sub tech sector will be cybersecurity. And these are their top picks. What do you think about that? Are you betting on any of these? Have you have you got any of these companies in your portfolio right now moving into 2024? Personally, I don't, but it, it could be something that I want to look at. Then we've got Magnificent Seven will lead uh, tech higher. We believe that the Magnificent Seven will have another robust year in 24 and lead tech higher with the core group of stocks set to be up 30% with AI front and center. So they are very much in the camp of we will continue to see a bull run across the Magnificent Seven. Um, and these last two, we won't talk about too much, but I'll just read them. Musk raises additional capital for X and goes for a super app concept. He's always said that he wants X to become a, a super app. He wants it to be able to do everything. Money transferring, social media, like the lot. Um, so they believe that's going to happen. And Microsoft and Apple will be on the four trillion path by the end of 2024. We believe Apple will be the first four trillion company followed by Microsoft. OK, do you guys think that that's going to happen? Do you think that it will be micro, uh, Apple, then Microsoft? Do you think NVIDIA will come before one of those? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. Potentially, potentially could happen. So let's now quickly look at what Palantir stock is doing. So we'll just refresh this quickly. We'll zoom, zoom, zoom. Here we go. So pre-market is up, but not by very much. So pre-market $17.96. So it looks to be just hovering under that $18 per share uh, region. In the last five days, it's been a bit all over the place. It's very much been, you know, at points flirting with $19. It's been getting there and then it's been coming back down. It's not been able to close at that position. It has really been a little bit all over the place. And one month actually down by 16.4 percent what is going to happen with palantir moving into 2024 and for the rest of 2024 like we keep saying no one truly knows but just decide if this is a long-term play and if it is then you've got to make your decision as to what price are you comfortable with accumulating shares okay now let's i'll check in on that just before we end the stream but let's go over to some comments who have we got with us today Okay, we've got some people that are um, come to the live streams quite a lot. So as always, guys, I appreciate you being here. I recognize, I recognize your name. We've got Mickey in the house. Thank you, Mickey, for coming. John, Midwest, Fast Eddie. Glad to see your internet is back. Yeah, me too. It was. Um, it really goes to show you how much we rely on the internet. Like I've spent the past two evenings watching Home Alone DVDs using the PlayStation uh, 3 or 4. Don't even know which one I've got. <laughs> which, you know, it's quite, it's quite nice, to be honest. It's quite a nice break not having the internet. But hey, I'm glad it's back. I think all of these predictions on Palantir stock prices boil down to its earnings report. Yeah, we, we're going to have an earnings report coming very, very soon after the new year starts, February, I believe. So we're going to have to see what comes out of that earnings. I think 
I'm going to make a video actually before before the earnings coming out talking about what I, I think will happen. Good morning. I'm up 47% year over year. Tony, is that your portfolio as a whole or is that just Palantir? Let me know. Let me see what my Palantir position is doing right now. Let's have a look. Let's see. Log on to the older trading two on two app. Okay. So in um, total, in total across not just, so when I, since I started investing in this platform, which was April 2023, so April this year, uh, my Palantir position is up by just under 40%. So it's been higher, it's been lower, but at the moment, 40%, which is great, you know, outdoes the uh, the market, which is good. Singapore, very cool, very cool. I hope you're having a lovely evening. Right, John, <laughs> I saw a comment that you have sold Palantir. What's going on? So your portfolio is pretty empty, but you're ready to invest. John, let us know what what's going on. What are you doing? What's your plans? I want to hear all about this. Very, very interesting. Uh, is Palantir a buy here? I think so. Uh, consolidating. What do you think? I think that is going to completely depend on how long you plan to hold and whether you are comfortable with having an average price that maybe is a little bit higher than you've had previously. Personally, um, I am continuing to buy, but what I'm not doing right now is adding lots and lots and lots. Does that make sense? So I, what I'm doing is I'm just going down the approach of dollar cost averaging. So each and every week or so, whenever I add more shares. But I don't just add shares of Palantir. I'm also adding shares of uh, Tesla and other positions in my portfolio. If we get a massive pullback or I think it's a particularly big opportunity, I'll add more. But I'm just continuing to add because at the moment, my primary focus is not necessarily about keeping my average as low as it can be, which is obviously nice. But it's about getting as many shares as I possibly can. And then I'm going to hold, hold, hold. But everyone, let, let um, old dog, great name, by the way, let old dog know your opinion on that question. Hoping Palantir continues in an upward trend. I'm in it for the long term. Yeah, I do think that we're going to see Palantir continue in an upward trend overall. It's just, you know, day to day, month to month. We It could go up, it could go down, of course. In my opinion, Palantir is a buy below 1750 Nice to have you back. Nice to be back, Sir Lallington. Uh, Pre-market nearly hitting 18. Yeah, let me see what it's doing right now. And I'll have a video coming out tonight on the main channel and probably one coming out on the second channel, Stock Speak, as well. Both fun videos, I think. Well, I'm biased, but <laughs> uh, pre-market right now, 17.95. So, yeah, very much might get to that 18 for sure. Palantir boot camps doing great. Yeah, they're doing fantastic. The demand is really there. They are going above and beyond on what they planned. Um, the feedback from them is exceptional. So yeah, absolutely. Their go-to-market strategy with AIP boot camps is working a treat. And of course, now other companies are looking to do that as well after seeing how successful they're being. I would hate for Palantir to drop under 17 um, I personally wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. And do you know why? Because I'd just add more and I'd be getting more chair, more chairs, more chairs for cheaper is what I'd be more shares for cheaper. But it's always, you know, a bit, uh, it's not nice to see the position that you're maybe all in on, or you've got a large stake in fall in. like it's not psychologically nice. But if you can move away from thinking that it looks horrible to thinking that it's just an opportunity and remind yourself that these stocks that are really intrinsically valuable will then go up over time. You're just basically walking into a supermarket and seeing your favorite chocolate bar reduced. You, you know, when, when you do that, like let's actually say you go to the shop right now and you see your favorite, favorite thing in that shop reduced by 20%, you wouldn't sit around and think, okay, that's not worth it. Like something's going on here. It's clearly not great. You'd be like, oh my God, that is amazing. Let me buy 10 of them. 
But when it comes to money, it's obviously a lot more emotional. And then you start doubting your conviction. It is really hard. But staying emotionless is um, it's a skill that I think every investor needs to needs to learn. And I'm trying myself as well. OK, we've got a quote here. So Chad Wallace and forward deployed engineer Palantir, when explaining AIP to a non-technical Fortune uh, 50 CEO, he said this. It's like today with reports, I'm trying to win the game by watching the scoreboard versus with AIP. It's the playbook to help me make the calls to win the game. It's like today with reports, I'm trying to win the game by watching the scoreboard versus with AIP. It's the playbook, the playbook to help me make the calls to win the game. I've not actually seen that quote. That's a really good one, actually. A few years could be 50, could be 150. Yeah, you said it there, Tony. We don't know. We don't know. Hi, Haley. 50 may be a stretch. If Palantir does go to 50, you have to promise to do a vid with your hair down. <laughs> um, so $50 for anyone that's tuning in now has come from Keith Fitz, Fitzgerald. He said that he thinks $50 could be what Palantir stock is worth within a few years. But I don't think it's far. I don't, you know, I don't disagree. Um, we've all got to make our price targets. But to be honest, no one knows where it's going. If Palantir, what I've said, well, I haven't actually agreed to this, but I will. St I, I may, may try and style my hair like Alex Carp's if Palantir hits all time highs when it does, maybe on a live stream. That'd be interesting. But I wear my hair down sometimes. So it wouldn't be hard to find a video already existing where my hair's down. <laughs> But yeah, I'll promise to do a video of my hair down. Why not? Um, this is one of ARK's funds. So this is their genomic fund, which has a many, many companies within that sector. And so why am I not buying that if I want to uh, have exposure to that sector? I did want an ETF, and that is one of the ETFs that look particularly uh, – it has a lot of companies in that I've done my research on and I do like the look of. However – that ETF is not available on my platform. So I, I couldn't get it basically. Um, <clears throat> but my plan is to keep researching the sector, keep researching the different companies, build my exposure, and I'll see what happens in the future. But yeah, I absolutely think it could be massive. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do know who that guy is. I do know who that guy. Now you've told me his surname. Love having my pension in the S&P 500. It keeps rising. Yeah, it's doing really well at the moment. And I'm going to make an end of year. Um, well, I'm going to make two videos. I'm going to do a normal portfolio update, which Sir Lallington, you get every week anyway as a Patreon member. But for everyone else, a, a video, a, page, uh, a, a portfolio update. But I'm also going to make a video showing how my different stocks and ETFs and maybe even crypto have performed over 2023. Could be interesting. I always want to be as transparent as possible. And I want to make these videos when it's doing well and when it's doing badly which I have done because I make them every single month. And obviously the Patreon members get updates weekly. I think that's important. It's a sports channel. You must be from Britain. <laughs> yes. See, I did say it. I think it was a sports channel. So I was half right. Uh, it's owned by Disney. Okay, cool. We all know what's happening with Disney and Tesla at the moment. Or Disney and X, Disney and Elon Musk, I guess, is more the... Uh, more the same. And then they've removed from Disney from the Teslas, haven't they now? Something like that. Cybersecurity is always needed. We always get emails from companies that have had their data breached. Yeah, I think I do think it could be a, a big sector. I just haven't looked into companies. So I couldn't I couldn't say which ones I would bet on. But I definitely agree with Dan Ives that it is, it is a sector to start taking notice of. So right now, I'm particularly interested in artificial intelligence, data analytics, um, the genomic space, and, you know, maybe even cybersecurity may be worth a look. Not financial advice, obviously. John is coming through here. Thumbs up button is busted. Let's all push it at once to fix it. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this was regarding, where is it? So Tony's portfolio in general is up 47% year over year. Fantastic. NVIDIA, Palantir and Tesla. Ciao from Italy. Thank you for joining. Appreciate that. Um, no, I don't. But I am covering, well, I don't on this channel. 
I mainly cover my portfolio, Tesla and Palantir on this channel and just some general market uh, stuff as well. But on my second channel, I can absolutely cover that stock. So go and subscribe and I will cover it at some point with many other companies too. I watch other investors and they love Costco. They say it's overvalued. Not one I have in my portfolio. Not one I have. Okay, Tony, I'm with you now. See, us Brits are very, very sarcastic. And if we were in person, I would 100% pick up on that. It's just when it's on a screen in just plain text, I don't always assume that it's sarcastic. But yeah, I would very much love it to drop short term as well. Do you think dollar cost averaging is the right approach for Palantir? Um, again, it's it's going to depend. For me, it's the right approach because at the moment, my primary aim is to get as many shares as possible. And the way I'm doing that is just by averaging in. Not, to, I mean, obviously, I want my cost average to be low. It's My cost average is very decent because my strategy is to continue to buy at, you know, every single week, pretty much which means sometimes I buy slightly high less, so higher, sometimes I buy slightly lower. On average, it balances out. However, because I also tend to buy more when it's lower, that brings my average down a little bit. Um, if it's the right approach or not, that's really subjective, really subjective. You could say that actually, well, there's actually people that have, that purchased a lot of their shares around the six, seven, eight dollar range, and they're not really buying now. Of course, they are depending on how many shares they got, they will probably do very much, you know, they, they will be doing better than I am because their cost average is so low. But it depends on the long term horizon. It depends when they're actually planning to sell versus when I'm planning to sell, when you're planning to sell. It, it really does depend. And it depends on your emotions involved as well, because for some people, dollar cost averaging just helps them know what they're doing and have a strategy and just back off a little bit. Whereas people that aren't following that and are picking and choosing when they're investing, if they then get too emotional, that could really cost them. But if they've got a price that they're willing to only buy under, again, sensible. I think it really depends. But we don't we don't know what's going to happen, do we? So it's hard to say. Like if I were to say that I'm only buying Palantir under $10, right? Let's just say that was my opinion. That was my strategy. I don't know, like no one knows, if it could even go below $10 again, or when that would happen if it did happen, which means then I've probably not had time in the market. I've tried to time the market and not been in the market for all of those months or for however long. So yeah, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard. Because ultimately, what you want to do is you Blake, you read my mind. Ultimately, what you want to do is you want to buy as low as possible and sell as high as possible and make your return as large as possible. But it's just actually doing that. Make sure to use the carp conditioner. Yeah, I've, I've stocked up. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Completely agree that being transparent with your portfolio is important. So many YouTubers only post their wins just to sell their products. Yeah, I've always said from day one that my main aim for this channel is to inspire and encourage other people to start investing, even if they don't have loads and loads of money. And for me, I'm not someone that has 100k sitting there ready to invest, like I just don't. But I'm really passionate about investing either way. And hopefully one day I'll be in a position where I have a lot more money to invest. But I think it's important to be transparent and show that actually, one, we don't always pick the right stocks and we don't always have portfolios that are doing really, really well. You know, some some years they'll go up, some years they'll go down and that's okay. And two, you can have a portfolio even if you don't have millions and millions to put in it. It will grow over time. It's more important to get started. Um, but yeah, I share I share my portfolio very, very transparently and I'll continue to do so. I will continue to do so. Do I have any Aussie stocks? No, I do not. I do not. Billy Rocket from Florida. Thank you for joining. We've got 131 people currently on the stream, which is really cool. Thank you to every single person that is here. <clears throat> 
Because of Palantir's strategy of try us out first and let quality of the product sell itself, the analysts hate it. Therefore, the potential is massive once they settle on a pricing structure. Yeah, I think when it comes to a lot of Wall Street analysts, it, we can't we can't really knock them. It's literally what they have to do, but they have to be able to see the numbers to then put a price target on it. There are some analysts, however, that do look at the potential and the future and, and what could happen and what is probably going to happen rather than just what has already happened and what is happening. But yeah, that, that is exactly it, isn't it? They, they don't like that strategy. They want to be able to see that Palantir is selling this amount at this price per whatever, and this is how much they're making, and this is how much it costs them. They want to see all of those numbers. But at the end of the day, it is also a lot or it's a big opportunity for retail investors because those retail investors that are understanding where the market is going, what the trends are, which companies are positioned to, you know, to make the most of those trends and which companies are providing value, that are seeing all those things, you know, the foundations are being laid. What could happen? Those are the ones that are that are getting in early enough to really make life changing money. I'm not saying that is going to happen with Palantir, like no one knows, but. Yeah, there's a lot of retail investors that are very, that are seeing a lot of things that maybe Wall Street analysts aren't. I would hate it if, Pat, yeah, there you go. I get the sarcasm now. <laughs> what would be, what would be your ideal Christmas present in stocks and shares? What do you mean, Sir Lallington? Please clarify and then I'll answer. Are you asking me what, I don't know. I, I want you to clarify. Another Patreon member. Thank you for coming. I'm enjoying, enjoying your new channel. I love a good Christmas. Thank you. New channel, Stock Speak, talking about lots of different companies, not just Palantir and Tesla over there, but Te Palantir and Tesla will probably be included in videos as well. Um, yeah, I've got some, I've got three videos planned for this week that I'll get filmed and get out on that channel. Probably one tonight, as long as I have a chance to, to get it sorted and turn around in that time. I'm really liking it. It's a fun channel. It's a fun, good time over there. Rio. Um, okay. Yeah. Cyclical. Cyclical, but some fantastic returns in the past for sure. Rio is um, a stock that a lot of a lot of dividend investors absolutely love for good, for good reason, I would say. Here we go. Say someone with a magic wand could make your dreams come true on one of your stocks. Okay. I think, hmm. So I would focus on either Palantir or Tesla because they're my largest position and therefore anything very bullish on those companies could impact my overall portfolio the most. I would either like to see, well, obviously I could say like I'd like the stocks to go to all time highs and above. I'd like to make tens of thousands of pounds or even more, but I'm not going to say it. I'm going to answer for what would I like to see the companies achieve in 2024? I would like to hear that Tesla is indeed going to start mass producing that affordable car. I think that would be absolutely massive. I would also like to hear that they, they're, they're making progress on FSD to the point where actually uh, it's so hard because of the regulatory barriers here. But it would be cool to see that they're actually starting to build out their robo taxi fleet. And then on the side of Palantir, I guess the biggest present would be amazing earnings, amazing earnings across the whole of the year, like knocking it completely out of the park. With that, AIP monetization. That would be good. That would be what I'd pick. But of course, if I could just have one thing, it would be that these positions do phenomenally well and my portfolio goes, whoosh, whoosh. that would be the best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll wait patiently. Pay great dividends, blue chip stocks. Yeah, and, and have a look at these companies in terms of are they, what what's their, 
what's their dividend stability like? Are they able to increase dividends year on year or are they cutting them some years and then increasing them and then stopping them altogether? Obviously, it's going to depend how much you rely on dividends. But if you are investing into dividend stocks for the point of dividends, then you want some some stability there. <clears throat> We've also got the S&P 500 inclusion for Palantir. So many things, so many things aligned. So I'm just going to check once more what Palantir is doing pre-market. Oh, okay, guys. Pre-market, $17.98. So let's just call that $18. We'll see what happens over the course of today. If the last few days are anything to go by, it will be up and down and all over the place, but we'll have to wait and see. On that note, thank you, everyone, to come into this live. I'll be back tomorrow, providing my internet doesn't go crazy, but it all looks good at the moment. Video coming out tonight on the main channel, I think as well on the second channel, Stock Speak. So make sure you're subscribed to both of those. Appreciate you all being here. Have a fantastic Tuesday and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye everyone. Thank you.